Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Wayward Bus by John Steinbeck. Dane reads. So, as you can see, my copy fell apart a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, they forgot everything else. They'd been on their way across country, a perilous journey, when their bus bogged down. While they were waiting for help, they went for a walk. This is only one of the life-crammed scenes. These are only two of the electrifying characters in another powerful novel by America's great John Steinbeck, author of The Pastures of Heaven, The Grapes of Wrath, Cannery Row, etc. All right, let's get rid of these knackered pages. Um, this book I will not be keeping or selling on eBay because I can't really sell it because it's knackered. So, you know, look away now if you don't like people doing stuff like, I'll tell you what, let's, here we go, you ready? Oh no! Oh! Right, okay, first tab. What have we got here? So, uh, this little bit here, uh, let's just. Steinbeck is one of those writers where the plot is like not packed and there's not loads of stuff happening, um, but just the way he writes is so beautiful. Like, all of these are pretty much just going to be great paragraphs, you know? Okay. The windows of the restaurant were screened against flies, and the screen door banged shut after every entrance or exit. For Alice Chicoy hated flies. In a world that was not easy for Alice to bear or to understand, flies were the final and malicious burden laid upon her. She hated them with a cruel hatred, and the death of a fly by swatter, or slowly smothered in the goo of flypaper, gave her a flushed pleasure. And so, um, this last Norma, she's a bit obsessed with Clark Gable when we get. Um, she liked older men with interesting faces, sometimes wiping the damp cloth back and forth on the counter. Her dream-widened eyes centred on the screen door, her pale eyes flexed and then closed for a moment. Then you could know that in that secret garden in her head, Gable had just entered the restaurant, had gasped when he saw her, and had stood there, his lips slightly parted, and in his eyes the recognition that this was his woman, and around him the flies came in and out with impunity. It never went beyond that. Norma was too shy, and besides, she didn't know how such things were done. The actual lovemaking in her life had been a series of wrestling matches, the aim of which was to keep her clothes on in the back seat of a car. So far she had won by simple concentration. She felt that Mr. Gable not only would not do things like that, but wouldn't like them if he heard about them. And then a character here, Alice, she gets hit by one. It goes, uh, one had hit her as he would a bug. He hadn't cared about it much. He hadn't even been very angry, just irritated. And he had hit a noisy thing to shut it up. Alice had only been trying to attract his attention in one of the few ways she knew. And this is a bit of characterization here which I quite like, so... Mr. Pritchard touched his glasses nervously. Oh, I see. He turned his head towards one and the light reflected from his glasses so that there were two mirrors with no eyes behind them. His hand whipped his watch chain out of his vest pocket. He opened a little gold nail file and ran the point quickly under each nail. He looked about and a little shudder of uncertainty came over him. Mr. Pritchard was a businessman, president of a medium-sized corporation. He was never alone. His business was conducted by groups of men who worked alike, thought alike, and even looked alike. His lunches were with men like himself who joined together in clubs so that no foreign element or idea could enter. His religious life was again his lodge and his church, both of which were screened and protected. One night a week he played poker with men so exactly like himself that the game was fairly even, and from this fact his group was convinced that they were very fine poker players. Wherever he went he was not one man but a unit in a corporation, a unit in a club, in a lodge, in a church, in a political party. His thoughts and ideas were never subjected to criticism, since he willingly associated only with people like himself. He read a newspaper written by and for his group. The books that came into his house were chosen by a committee which deleted material that might irritate him. He hated foreign countries and foreigners because it was difficult to find his counterpart in them. He did not want to stand out from his group. He would like to have risen to the top of it and be admired by it, but it would not occur to him to leave it. At occasional stags where naked girls danced on the tables and sat in great glasses of wine, Mr. Pritchard howled with laughter and drank the wine, but 500 Mr. Pritchards were there with him. We get a nun's hood here, um, which... I hadn't heard that expression before, but we'll go ahead and read this bit out. Her married life was fairly pleasant and she was fond of her husband. She thought she knew his weaknesses and his devices and his desires. She herself was handicapped by what is known as a nun's hood, which prevented her experiencing any sexual elation from her marriage. And she suffered from an acid condition which kept her from conceiving children without first artificially neutralising her body acids. Both of these conditions she considered normal, and any variation of them abnormal and in bad taste. Women of lusty appetite she spoke of as that kind of woman, and she was a little sorry for them as she was for dope fiends and alcoholics. 
Here we get something about fur coats, which is a vegan, obviously. I, I am not a fan of fur. This morning, Mildred wore a sweater and pleated skirt and low moccasin-like shoes. The three sat at the little table in the lunchroom. Mrs. Pritchard's three-quarter length black fox coat hung on a hook beside Mr. Pritchard. It was his habit to shepherd this coat, to help his wife on with it and to take it from her, and to see that it was properly hung up and not just thrown down. He fluffed up the fur with his hand when it showed evidence of being crushed. He loved this coat, loved the fact that it was expensive, and he loved to see his wife in it and to hear other women speculate upon it. Black Fox was comparatively rare, and it was also a valuable piece of property. Mr. Pritchard felt that it should be properly treated. He was always the first to suggest that it go into summer storage. He had suggested that it might be just as well not to take it to Mexico at all. First, because that was a tropical country, and second, because of bandits who might possibly steal it. Mrs. Pritchard held that it should be taken along because, in the first place, they would be visiting Los Angeles and Hollywood where everyone wore fur coats, and second, because it was quite cold in Mexico City at night, so she had heard. Mr. Pritchard capitulated easily. To him, as well as to his wife, the coat was the badge of their position. It placed them as successful, conservative and sound people. You get better treatment everywhere you go if you have a fur coat and nice luggage. Unless you go to a PETA meeting, in which case you're going to get spat on. Then we get this delightful character who calls um, Hindus, he calls them goddamn ragheads. Why didn't they learn English before they start running around? Why don't you fuck off? Um, all right. Oh, by the way, I was telling that to the character, not to the... Uh, and then he doesn't like old women either, so uh, Louis goes, that seat's taken, ma'am. Don't you see the suitcase beside it? He hated old women. They frightened him. There was a smell about them that gave him the willies. They were fierce and they had no pride. They never gave a damn about making a scene. They got what they wanted. Well, yeah, it's because they've realised pride be damned. So we get this little exchange. You've been a mess all morning, he said. What's the matter with you? Well, it's my time, said Alice. And then this toothache. One knew the first was not true, but he only suspected the second could be false. Take yourself a slug of liquor when we go. That'll be good for both ends, he said. Yeah, if it is your period, liquor. <laughs> I mean, oh god, in, there's a rainbow kiss joke there, but we're, we're not going to go into that. If you don't know what a rainbow kiss is, it's what happens when you lick her when she's on a pier. Hello, this is the wayward cat. This is the wayward cat. He's, ah! Ah! Okay, I'll put you down. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here we go. We're friends again now. Okay, where did I put that book, Biggie? We get this line here. He would sleep in Norma's bed if Alice passed out. He couldn't stand the smell of her when she was drunk. She had an acid bitter smell. Um, so, so I quit drinking about nine months ago. And it's true, people stink when they're drunk. My ex used to drink like red wine. And then she'd like go in for a kiss and I'd be like, fucking hell. Can you go and brush your teeth? <laughs> Maybe that's why she's my ex. Bernice too could draw a magic circle around herself with motherhood or say menstruation, a subject like that and no man could or would try to get in. Business was her husband's magic circle. She had no right to go near him when it was business. She had no knowledge nor interest in business. It was his privacy and she respected it. It's a very old fashioned view. But obviously from the time he was writing, you know. Uh, we get somebody here who's, um, he says he registered his idea. Uh, what do you mean registered? Well, I wrote out a description, made some drawings and put it in an envelope and mailed it to myself, registered mail. That proves when I did it because that envelope is sealed. Yeah, that's a common fallacy. I've heard authors say that as well, where they're like, yeah, I protected my manuscript by mailing it to myself. That, that, that is insufficient, mate, sauce. But no, on the plus side, nobody's going to steal it anyway, so it's fine. So we get this story, which I think is interesting. Uh, what became of him, Breed asked. I don't know, somebody got him, I guess. He couldn't stay home when there was any fighting. He had to get in it. I don't think he much cared what they were fighting about. When he came home, he was full of stories every time. One chuckled. He used to tell one about Pancho Villa. He said a poor woman came to Villa and said, you have shot my husband and now I and the little ones will starve. Well, Villa had plenty of money then. He had the presses and he was printing his own. He turned to his treasurer and said, roll out five kilos of 20 peso bills for this poor woman. He wasn't even counting it, he had so much. So they did and they tied the bills together with wire and that woman went out. Well, then a sergeant said to Villa, There was a mistake, my general. We did not shoot that woman's husband. He got drunk and we put him in jail. Then Pancho said, Go immediately and shoot him. We cannot disappoint that poor woman. Great little story. And we get this line, which possibly still relevant and still accurate today. Uh, women were more friendly or more vicious to one another in public toilets, but on personal terms. Perhaps that was because there were no men. Because where there were no men, there was no competition and their poses dropped from them. I would like to think it isn't relevant today, but I think it probably still is. 
Fun story, when I was at university, the women used to come in and use the men's toilets because the women's were always like super full. There was the same number of toilets, but my, my uni was 80% female. Uh, so they always used to come into the men's. But they'd literally like, I'd be there taking a leak at the urinal and suddenly five girls would come in and they would like make no, like they wouldn't have any qualms. They'd like look and be like, that and you're there at the urinal trying to take a piss and trying to hold your dick like hide your dick from view because they're trying to look at it pretty weird we get this line from mr pritchard i didn't want to come i didn't want to at all i hate foreign countries particularly dirty ones and to me i just thought well surely every country is foreign to somewhere else and every country is dirty so and uh, so this this woman um she says she wants to get this new coat uh and uh she says eddie's gonna give it to me when did he tell you i asked her Lorraine just laughed. He didn't tell me. You don't even know it yet. Well, I said, look, you're nuts. You want to bet? Lorraine will take a bet on anything. I don't bet on things, so I said, how are you going to go about it? If I tell you, will you keep it to yourself, she said. It's easy. I know Eddie. I'm going to needle him tonight and keep needling him till he gets mad. And I'm going to keep right on until he throws a punch at me. I may even have to step into one because when Eddie's a little drunk, he misses pretty bad. Well, then I'm going to let Eddie stew in his own juice. I know Eddie. He'll get to feeling mean and sorry. You want to take that bet, she said. I'll even lay down a time. I'll bet you I have that coat by tomorrow night. So she's like literally getting her husband to punch her so that she feels bad so she can get her new coat. It's crazy. And there are people like that out there, men and women. I'm not saying it's a female only thing by any, any means. To be fair, they both sound like awful people. So fuck them, fuck them both. Great line here as well. So uh, Mr. Pritchard went back to the bus for his wife. He was feeling ashamed about his anger of a little time ago. He had the hard knot in his stomach he got when things were not going well, a fist-like knot. Charlie Johnson said he must have an ulcer, and Charlie was pretty funny about it. He said no one under $25,000 a year got an ulcer. It was a symptom of a bank account, Charlie said. And unconsciously, Mr. Pritchard was a little proud of the pain in his stomach. I mean, I guess kind of true, because you're more likely to get them through stress and stuff, and if you've got a high-paying job, you're probably doing a lot of stressful shit, you know? Probably selling out your soul as well while you're at it. So yeah, that's about all I want to share from The Way Will Bust by John Steinberg. Overall, I did enjoy it. Uh, it's one of those where the plot is a little slow, but that doesn't matter because it's all really about the ideas and the prose. And uh, again, I think by some of the lines that I've read out to you, you get a feel for why I enjoyed the prose. Overall, it was a pretty solid 3.5 out of 5 for me, and I would recommend it. Although, don't get an edition like this because it's just, you know... So there we have it, that's what I made of The Wayward Bus by John Steinbeck. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye